<laughs> Greetings, mammalians. Welcome to Wall Street Wildlife. The investing podcast that'll help you better understand how to make money in the stock market. I'm Christoph Monkey Pikarski. And I'm Luke the Badger Hallard. You're finding us on, what is it, Wednesday the 1st of November. Uh, it's our second episode. Hopefully you've hit that like and subscribe button already. But it is the 1st of November. Yesterday was Halloween. It's early morning for Christoph. Did you have a late Halloween night last night, buddy? Were you out with the spooks? I was out with the spooks, dressed as a shiny, happy, yellow Care Bear. I got all, all the uh, treats, zero tricks, so it was a, <laughs> so it was a good night for me. Uh, here in Austin, That's Texas. baby face. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about my personality. Am I a monkey? Am I a bear? What am I? I don't know. You're a bear on the outside, a monkey on the inside. <laughs> and how about you? Where, where, where are you at? What did you see on Hallow's Eve? I'm, uh, I'm Hong Konging it still. Um, yesterday, I got, I'm going out for a run every day. I didn't actually have a, a Halloween party on the agenda. We did our Halloween on Saturday at something called the Wine and Dine Festival, which is a ton of fun. I dressed my buddy Albert up, if you're a telescope investing fan. Yes, that Albert. I dressed him up as a green bean, like a pea in a pod. I was a chef and we, uh, we drank a ton of wine. But I did check out the very attractive young ladies in their stockings with their giant wings in Langoy Fong. That was fun yesterday. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. I didn't know. It's amazing. Halloween is one of those things where it's hard, it's, it's hard to know whether it's a thing culturally or not so it's cool to hear that hong kong has a has a big uh halloween tradition that it follows that's awesome like it's in, from what i can tell like second only to las vegas oh, they're wow. really into getting dressed up oh wow yeah <laughs> all right well let's talk about the stock market yeah we've got a ton of big topics for our second episode we're going to give you guys an owl's nest segment we're going to talk about being wrong versus staying wrong I've got a Phoenix or Dodo. I've got a company, Nanox Imaging. Can it save itself and claw its way back out of the flames? And we're also going to share another portfolio update uh, in our King of the Jungle stock challenge. Investing is hard. Investing is very hard because it's probabilities based and we're dealing with complex systems. And when I say complex systems, I mean something like there are so many variables to contend with. And when you have multiple vari variables, new uh, unexpected phenomena emerge that could not have been predicted. So a little bit of chaos theory. So it's impossible, literally impossible to get things right. And so as investors, being wrong is part of the landscape. You cannot, you just cannot be right all the time or even, even say most of the time. So how do you become a successful investor? It's, it's about, uh, well, there are a lot of things you can control and there are a lot of things you can do to win the game. But I thought it was important to talk a little bit, bit about that inevitability of being wrong versus figuring out or learning that you were right, wrong about something and then refusing to either acknowledge it or continuing to double down on it, or triple down, or quadruple down. And sadly, I've been guilty of this many, many times. You know, when I think one of the things we're trying to do with this podcast is not, you know, sell you fl fluffy sprinkle dust, you know, cheerleading stories, but like, it's like, this is what the real facts on the ground of investing are. And knowing yourself, knowing as a human that you are going to make mistakes, you humans, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's a question of what do you do with those mistakes when they happen and acknowledging them is the hardest thing, one of the hardest things. It makes you feel bad, right? Yeah, it's like human nature, right? We, uh, we make an error and then we kind of entrench ourselves in that view. Confirmation bias comes into play. We start looking for data that supports our incorrect position and we just go deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole. And maybe that's fine if you're arguing about Star Trek with your buddy, but if it comes to like investments and money, that's costing you money because you're uh, 
you know, you're plowing deeper and deeper into that hole you've dug for yourself. I learned something in one of my psychology books, or whatever, maybe it was in psychology book, whatever, behavioral studies. It's actually proven uh, that when you admit a mistake, it releases some neurotransmitters are released that are painful. So it's literally, literally on the, on the level of our bodies, admitting a mistake hurts. Therefore, people find ways not to admit they were wrong to avoid the pain. So it's not a, we're not talking about, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's as literal, it's as, it's, it's, it's as literal uh, phenomena as you can get. Therefore, therefore, I think talking about it like this and naming it and saying like, yeah, this is the case. You're going to feel pain if you're wrong. So if you want to be a good investor, you know, it's a little bit about sucking up the pain and pushing through it rather than denying it. So let's bring it to life a little bit. You've got a particular mistake you've made that maybe you didn't own up to quickly enough. Investing <laughs> mistake. Let's not talk about relationships. <laughs> I saw the look on your face. <laughs> You're a newly married man. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness uh yes i have slipped on on some rotten banana i have eaten some rotten bananas before and slipped on banana peels it's true uh investing mistakes yeah i mean yeah too many to count unfortunately um i'll talk about one because i i talked about my first pick for for my portfolio on our first episode eos is uh, currently one of the biggest mistakes of my investing career, and that had to do with over allocation because I was so confident in the thesis that, of course, the complexity and all the knowns when they show up, uh, you know, like, oh, where the, you know, where did that come from? Well, of course, it, I, we couldn't have pre predicted all these. Well, some people maybe did, but uh, so it was a mistake of let's say over confidence was the seed then out of that was the double down mistake of over allocation which is a failure of proper risk management uh, I, i'd say yeah and yet and yet it was my first selection for my new portfolio for king of the jungle because despite all that i still think the thesis itself is intact it's just that the price action in the short term did the exact opposite of what I thought it would do. And it's been massively painful for my portfolio. So, so human mammals at home listening, do not do what I did. Yeah. If you're a lo uh, long time, no limit, uh, listener, then like Christoph and I had this conversation a couple of times, I was tearing my hair out at his <laughs> like 20, 30% allocation in this completely crazy, like, not a meme stock, like I'm sure there's value there, but it's not the kind of investment that you want to have more than, in my view, 1% of your portfolio in. That sounds an awful lot, uh, Badger, like, uh, <laughs> like I told you I was right. <laughs> hey, look, if it, went, if it went great, right, you'd be, you'd be flying high if, uh, if, if the thesis had played out as quickly as you hoped it was. And like, I truly hope it does, because I've got, I'm backing your idea. I've got a small investment in EOS as well. Um, but yeah, it's not the kind of stock I'll be overextending myself on. I've got some other trash in my portfolio. I'm not saying that's trash, sorry. <laughs> uh, you want to you wanna talk about your, uh, your trash heap? <laughs> with, with... Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I didn't really prep for this segment, but... Uh, yeah, like a mistake that I doubled down on and doubled down on. Maybe, maybe Twitter, perhaps. Twitter. Oh, um, I kind of got away with it by the skin of my pants. But uh, I was an early adopter of Twitter, early-ish. Uh, I, I joined the platform in 2007, I think. Um, and I've been I've, I've sort of listening. I wasn't tweeting away. Um, but I kind of got, eventually, what it was and how potentially crucial it was going to be to like the news flow in the future. So I bought stock and my stock kind of halved over a couple of years. I'm like, I still like this company. So I doubled down and then it halved again and I doubled down again. And I'm like, what the heck? Uh, and then I just kind of gave up on it. Um, and I, just, I let it ride and I got away with that mistake 
because you don't want to be chasing your losers unless you have a really fundamental reason to believe that's a strong turnaround story, which I did not have. Um, you want to be backing your winners, like water the flowers and trim the weeds, is the, uh, the saying. But I was definitely watering that weed. I got away with it because uh, Musk bid up the company, essentially, took it private, and I got out uh, in that flurry, and I got out basically with my original investment intact. But, uh, but yeah, you don't want to be doing that kind of dumb stuff. Yeah, there won't be a knight in shining armor for, for each and every company. So, mm, uh, totally. And so I, I'll end maybe to go full circle. Uh, what's interesting about this is that, you know, things do change very quickly. So right now I would say I was wrong about EOS because of the risk management that I just spoke about. However, they're reporting earnings on uh, November 6th and 7th. And this is such an asymmetric situation right now that if they say anything positive that in this particular case it's we have found a way to finance our way to close the department of energy loan what we are looking at potentially in the next as the thesis starts playing out and the battery lines start going online and so forth our return our massive absolutely massive returns and so Right now, I'm eating humble pie, but one of these virtues of investing is to continue to double check the way you were wrong. And if you know, don't, in other words, it would be tripling my mistake if all of a sudden I said, Oh, I was wrong and I made this and this mistake, and so now I'm gonna cash out because you know it was a disaster and and uh, uh. And now I have to eat my humble pie. No. What is the fundamental thesis, right? Is that still intact? Yes, it is. So I kind of, it's kind of like this, um, what's it called? I, I experienced it as period of forbearance in this case. No, in other words, I'm saying know the kind of mistake you make. It's not like, oh, a mistake equals I need to have sold, if that makes sense. Right. I'm going to challenge, I agree with you, but I'm going to challenge that a bit. And it's, you know, you're, you're in the shit with this stock now. So you kind of got to, you know, you're playing from this, this difficult position. And so the decisions you'll make here are different to someone who has no position today. But let's, let's use, play a bit of no limit games, right? Let's bring a poker analogy into this. So like a crucial thing when you're studying your own play in poker and you're trying to improve your game is look at your decision making and don't like judge your decision making don't judge the outcome mm -hmm. like if you make a bad call and you win you still made a bad call and the fact that you win actually is potentially even more dangerous because you're more likely to make that same bad call or bad fold again in the future um so so if your error was over allocating like that was the error and you have to learn from that if you get away with it because eos does shoot to the moon that doesn't mean you didn't make an error you still made an error and you have to like, you know, wipe your brow and say, phew, the gods of chance saved me there, but uh, I don't want to go all in on a stock like this again. Luke told me. <laughs> that's, that's right, Badger. <laughs> like, keep going at it. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, that's, that's exactly right. I think the phenomenon is called resulting that you were talking about, right? Like yeah. judging, judging right. outcomes right. by the results rather than the process. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think we're, we're saying the same thing in different ways. Uh, I'm saying mistakes were made and simultaneously the thesis is not, uh, has not been disproven. I do, I am counting on, uh, uh, disproportionately on the gods, the stock gods to kind of uh, rescue me <laughs> from my, from the mistake. Right. But selling now to me feels like it would be tripling the mistake. And so in the future... Sure. Uh, I'll have Badger yapping at me, uh, and, and maybe, maybe I'll listen more. <laughs> it's probably, I, I don't know, I'm not smart enough with options to tell you how to navigate it, but there might be some kind of hedgy things you could do uh, where you can kind of structure your and reduce the volatility of some of that position somehow. Yes, absolutely, and I, I have been doing that, but I haven't been openly oh, talking about it. Okay. So yes, 
Uh, and that's one of the things <laughs> we'll, I will be sharing a lot more of in future episodes, the option uh, managing your position stuff. Okay. Good stuff. Let's do a Phoenix or Dodo, our first Phoenix or Dodo of this new format. Uh, and I've got a doozy for you, which actually is not dissimilar to what we are just talking about. I've got a junk stock that I bought and I actually doubled down on a couple of months ago. <laughs> Let me rationalize it and you can tell me if this is a bad decision. <laughs> are you trying Here to confuse go. my identity? Am I a monkey? Am I a badger? Am I a, a dung heap beetle? <laughs> There's a, look, no, because badgers can still, badgers with their sensible burrows and their books and their reading, they can still own wild ass shit, but they just have a tiny bit uh-huh. in the corner. They don't have like this huge mountain. Right. So here's this tiny bit of shit I've got in my portfolio. Uh, Nanox Imaging. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of a meme stock in 2020, 2021, and it peaked an evaluation of about $4 billion in January 21. It's currently worth just, uh, just over $280 million. So down like 93% at the time of us speaking. So who are they? What do they do? Uh, in a nutshell, they think they, they claim they have reinvented the X-ray machine. So if you get into the science, if you go to like a hospital, the reason hospitals are where you have to go and get an X-ray is it's not just like that, that little room you go into and you stick your arm or your head inside the machine. There's this other massive room with this huge piece of equipment uh, with like massive cooling systems. It's incredibly expensive, requires a ton of power to be able to generate the X-ray. So these guys claimed that they had actually put all of this pretty much on a semiconductor, like an X-ray device on a chip. Um, And I won't get into too much of the science, mostly because I don't really understand it. Um, uh, And they had a really interesting business model that kind of sucked me in, where the idea was they were going to stick these machines out in the field and mostly targeting um, like the developing world, particularly some African nations, and they were going to charge uh, users on a per scan basis. So they were positioning us as M SAS. Everyone loves like SAS. If you could in 2020, 2021, if you could stick SAS in your name somewhere, that was like AI today. So they were like medical scanning as a service like bullshit acronym didn't make any sense but anyway that was a business model so the market didn't believe them frankly i watched a bunch of their investor days their ceo i mean he's like something off of a carnival where he's doing his demos i was literally watching some of the demos like frame by frame to try and see are they actually cheating like they were they were doing like an x-ray are they really doing the x-ray are they just faking it like it looked so hokey uh like like a barnum show but I, I had my investment, tiny amount. I'm like, I've written this off. But then they got FDA approval earlier this year and blew my mind. So the FDA have uh, now endorsed and given uh, 510k approval, I think, to their multi-source emitter, which is basically uh, the technology they have, which could, in theory, replace the massive X-ray machine and all the gubbins and the energy and the power. Um, the FDA have said that this is as good or better than existing technologies. That's what that approval means. So uh, maybe it's real, I don't know. But then, you know, Theranos looked pretty good. The, uh, the blood company run by Elizabeth Holmes, that was looking pretty good until that whole house of cards fell down too. So right now, I doubled my investment when the FDA endorsed it, approved it, because <laughs> I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> because uh, you're a... Right now, <laughs> the tiny investment, uh, and there are like massive existential risks. The market has no, no confidence in them. They need to scale out manufacturing. Who knows if they can do it? Suspiciously, like there's no interest, seemingly no interest from the giants in this space already that produce these X-ray machines or you know, big hospitals. You'd think someone would take a chunk if they're like a sub $300 million company. So it just looks fishy as fuck, basically. <laughs> um, so Phoenix or Dodo, I've, I've pitched it to you. Are these guys, based on what I just told you, are these guys potentially a turnaround story? Can they phoenix from the flames? Or are they just a doomed dodo and they're taking my capital with them? 
they are a doomed dodo, and you're a dodo for for, for, for even for because oh 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 this feels good to be in the righteous chair from from, from where where I was but the sitting. FDA approved them. Yeah. See, isn't that wild? Here's the difference. Here's the difference. I think between our our two sort sort of mistake story stocks in EOS. Uh, what I it, it, it's uh, let's say it's about execution risk and it's about that the product is uh, how do I say this when the US, United States Department of Energy signs the seal of approval for a product that is needed to help stabilize national security via the electrical grid and these guys have been in business for 15 years and there's massive orders and 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 right it's a physical product that is already right it's it, it that's a kind of like dangerous investment because it could go wrong in all kinds of ways and it probably will go wrong right probabilities are not in its favor but that's still wildly different from <laughs> uh well, I guess I would say the biotech sector in general, because their fate is entirely like roulette wheel-ish. Will the FDA approve or won't they? But if you add on top of that some of these chimerical claims of you know magic devices, and all of a sudden, you're the one who told me to go to, uh, when I was in Las Vegas, to go to see what, Absinthe? <laughs> the, uh, Ooh, I, I, yeah. <laughs> what a great show, by the way, folks. If you're in Vegas, go see Absinthe. Trust me, sit in the front row, too. You'll love it. <laughs> uh, um, it felt like uh, listening to you pitch Nanox right now. And by the way, I was also in it <laughs> during the meat stock era. So <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, there we go. <laughs> Uh, but I got out. Like if you're listening to the show, we we do own some quality companies. Yes. We don't just own this, this shit house of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I think uh, I'm getting like that's a carnival, right? That's a carnival, and I would not call that investing. That's uh, straight up gambling. And maybe you know, for some folks, if you have a segment of your portfolio called called the, the you know, just label skull crossbones. Uh, yeah. 100 to 1 odds, you know, racetrack kind of shit. Have fun. If you're I, having fun, are you having like, fun, I call buddy? That my, uh, yeah, I, I got, so I have that segment of my portfolio. I call that my venture portfolio because that's like the wild shit that, like, I'm, like so my, my sort of way I think about that chunk of the portfolio is like it's less than 5% as a whole of the entire portfolio. So if the whole thing catches fire, it's not really going to hurt me. And I think of it like, probably everything in that sub portfolio is going to burn. But if one thing does well, that thing is going to hundred X. I just don't know which of these things is going to be the hundred X, maybe none of them. Um, but I think that's the way to play that, that junk stuff basically. Yeah. Well, the hundred X I have is EOS in there. EOS is in my venture portfolio. By okay. The way. Well, I was going to say junk. if, if, yeah. <laughs> if that badger brain of yours, uh, if that badger body had any brains, it would uh, sell the Nanox and put it all into EOS. Obviously. <laughs> like, but not obviously, because what you because what you do want is, if you're going to make these wild ass bets, you want to make as many of them as possible, because you don't know which one is going to pay off, and so you do want to, you know, if you're giving me, uh, like, a hundred to one odds on a ninety nine to one shot, I don't know if this is going to work. Like, I want to place that bet as many times as possible, so I'm max I'm minimizing the volatility, I'm maximizing my return. So in the same way, I think, like, I want. Um, yeah, I want like a ton of crazy aspects so that I have a higher chance of one of them just like lucking into making bank. Okay, so uh, w w w so Nano, Nan Nanox, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm calling it a dodo and I'm, I'm saying it's a mistake to even hold it at this point. Uh, let's see what happens. Yeah. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to continue to hold it because I like it in that part of the portfolio, but I think I agree with you. And th this segment is Phoenix or Dodo. I think we're giving this one a firm Dodo thumbs down. Uh, if you own the stock, like, let the buyer beware. Oh, man, I, I need to... Uh, I have a Dodo hat, so next time I'll be prepared to, to put on my Dodo hat. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, 
our own portfolios, Sir Badger Luke. What's uh, yes. tell me, monkey? <laughs> <laughs> Should we do the reveal? Like, so, uh, for a quick reminder, we this is only episode two. I bought five things. I'm not going to tell you what they all are. I'm going to tell you week by week. Last week, I announced CrowdStrike, but I bought another four things. What did you do last week? Last week, I did a few things, but I made a huge purchase in uh, what is now my top position that I would like to tell you about. I made a, a very sizable uh, starting purchase of 40... Two percent of our in, wow. of our initial uh, of our initial uh, allocation thousand dollar allocation. So four hundred. So it was. Wait, am I? Am yeah, I, you mean yeah four hundred four twenty right? Yeah, about four hundred twenty dollars in Coherus Biosciences. So the reason I did this is in part. Uh, I was monkeying around and over allocating. So in a sense, repeating the same error as with EOS. Uh, but I feel really good about this one, Luke. I feel really good about this one because, <laughs> <laughs> because, because, oh my God, where, where do I, where do I start? Okay. It has biosciences in the name. So that's a warning flag. And many wise investors would say by definition that kind of puts you in a binary will they or will they not and it then pushes you toward oh this is this is monkey gambling again sector however i think out of out of all the stocks that i, I i've looked at this is the one that actually has the most asymmetric upside risk uh, upside uh, uh potential with the least amount of risk uh, relative, relatively, right? That's how I kind of think about it. And the reason is because Coherence Biosciences already has three FDA approved biosimilars that are selling and they just started. Two of them are increasing the amount of money that, are, that they're bringing in. One just went on the market July 1st. And <clears throat> so they have three, right? So in other words, cash is coming in. And that cash is being used to essentially fund their immuno-oncology wing. So it's kind of like a company doing two. The immuno-oncology wing by itself, if successful, will be worth magnitudes more. But that is just the, that, that puts it in that square pre-revenue, a lot of risk, will they, won't they category. However, the cash flows is what Wall Street is missing because it's not exactly visible yet because they're just going to start ramping up massively and yet Wall Street is pricing it as though it's about to run out of cash. So there's this huge gap between what is internally happening in the company, what Wall Street sees, and it's going to be massively re-rated, says I. On top of that, right as I made, uh, when the stock dipped to $2.80 uh, last Friday, uh, uh, to me, it's massively, uh, it's so massively undervalued that, that I just couldn't, I could not help myself from pressing the, the buy button. And that Friday afternoon, after market close, it announced another FDA, their major immuno-oncology dr drug, Tori for short, was approved by the FDA. And that, they had a conference call, and on the conference call, uh, they said the interest by other companies in this drug is massive. We have all kinds of partnership uh, opportunities lined up. It plays well with our other immuno-oncology drugs that we just acquired. And so the stock, I think, is beginning its reversal uh, to the upside. And so far, it's looking great for my portfolio. Good for you. Good for you. Like, this is a case of... Uh... Don't do what Christoph says. Like, if you're starting out, the idea of this segment is, a quick reminder to you, buddy, is <laughs> we're helping the new yeah. investors like figure out how to navigate the market and build a portfolio. So if you want to be like a monkey, you do what he did, and you stick 42% of your portfolio in one crazy-ass stock. <laughs> that's, uh, that's not investing. That's gambling. <laughs> I guess this year's going to tell us, right? Does your gambling pay off or not? Uh, 
I've done something much safer. Yeah, well, no. What, 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 you, say, what you say is so important. Uh, um, it, it, let's not make the same result. Let's not make the same mistake we just warned our listeners about. The resulting. It should not matter whether this pays off for me because it's the process we're talking about, right? So in theory, I made the same mistake again that I made with EOS because I have such high confidence in this company, right? And I have my justifications, right? And I couldn't help myself in this instance because I need this dinner <laughs> and I need you <laughs> serving it to me in the Badger's outfit. So, so, but process-wise, right, Badger is exactly right because whether or not this goes up 10x in theory should not, uh, should not determine whether this was the right move or not. Now, uh, whether I would do this in my, say, real portfolio in this size Hopefully not, but in this setup, uh, that's what I did. Let's just be clear about the spirit of this contest, because I'm I'm going to be managing my portfolio in a disciplined badger-like way, and I've kind of got an idea about how I'm going to do that. But I'm basically playing against this like fruit machine, like a you know a jackpot machine, and <laughs> who knows, right? You know, it's basically a, it's going to be a coin flip because your volatility is going to determine whether you win or lose. Um, so, like, if you want to play the game that way to win the dinner, I don't think you're going to teach listeners, like, how to be a disciplined technical investor by sticking 42% of anything in anything. That's right. That's your job. And my job is to uh, make money and, and get fancy dinners. And <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on your head bit. On your you know what? Bit. Yeah, I think what's the what's the, what's the famous phrase? I'd rather I'd rather uh, uh, be lucky than good. I'd rather be be well fed and have a nice uh, stash of bananas <laughs> than than be right. <laughs> okay, if you listen to this podcast, just to, it, for this segment for the next fifty weeks, <laughs> ignore everything Christoph says. <laughs> We'll all just observe him either like go to the moon or catch fire and we can laugh. If you want to learn how to manage a portfolio, listen to me. <laughs> oh, this is what did I do? To... Complete opposite. <laughs> okay, I, I did the complete opposite. So uh, last week I bought five things. Uh, I, I told you guys about CrowdStrike. My CrowdStrike investment was down. 3%, but uh, in the course of recording this episode, it's now nearly break-even. They seem to have recovered uh, over the last half an hour somehow. Um, but the other stock I'll tell you about that I bought isn't the stock. I bought an ETF. Um, this is actually the only ETF I own in my real portfolio. Uh, I don't own this exact one, but I own something like it. Um, so the one I bought here is the MSCI India ETF an index called NDIA, that's the ticker, and it's basically a collection of large and mid-cap stocks in India, and it constitutes about 85% of the Indian stock market, um, so which means it's mostly like finance, banks, industrial and chemical companies, and tech. Um, why did I buy this ETF, and why do I own it in my own portfolio? Because bloody hell, what is happening in India is incredible, and they're on such a crazy, crazy growth trajectory. Whether it plays out over the course of one year and wins me a dinner, I don't know. But this is a robust, solid investment. And I can't get exposure to India really any other way unless you're an Indian national or a person of Indian origin. Um, I'll just give you four quick data points why I think this is such an exciting ge geography to be investing in. One is demographics. Um, by 2030, 70% of the work population in India will be working, whereas we've got this like baby boomer crisis and there's increasing volume of people in the West, in the UK and the US, who will be in retirement. That's a really horrible place to be as a society. Very hard to manage your finances and you know, manage uh, pensions for people who are in uh, kind of state-backed jobs. Um, in India, though, 70% of people are going to be working age, and that's explosive. Um, huge influx of young people starting investing. Over 100 million investors now compared to 20 million a decade ago. Um, expendable income is set to double uh, for the average household over the coming decade. People have got more money, 
they can spend more on luxury goods, they can invest more. Um, and then at, at the sort of top end of society, you've got this emerging middle class, but you've also got the wealthy class in India. And that's set to 5x, the number of people that are considered to be in the wealthy class, five times as many over the next seven years. And I, you know, I guess that demographic in particular are going to be big investors. So it's just an incredibly strong growth story. Uh, and I want to be part of it. And buying this ETF is a good way to do that. Hey, Luke, can you re remind me uh, what the ticker is and why you picked that one out of the, uh, all the other ETFs? Because uh, in the uh, So really, I mean, on, on, on my app, I only had two available on my investment app, unfortunately. So the one I picked was NDIA, um, which is uh, it, it's the iShares MSCI India ETF. Okay. It's about 140-something companies, I think, currently. Okay. So it's, it's kind of the market. It's kind of the whole market. Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we we had a great conversation about India and uh, what a smart uh, play I think for the very long term. Uh, India, right? The thesis essentially is India is on its way to becoming the world's great power potentially. Absolutely. Yeah, they got a space program. They got all sorts of um, like significant stuff they're doing, and they're becoming a manufacturing hub for the world. Right. Mm -hmm. um, starting to manufacture iPhones there. It's becoming like a big growth market for selling iPhones yep. with this wealthy class. Um, you know, just one tiny example, but uh, yeah. So should we, should we run the numbers? So you've got your crazy like, game of bingo and we've got my super stable stuff. Let's see who's actually ahead though. Uh, I think we know the answer to this already. <laughs> <laughs> crazy game of Tell bingo. You, you insult my honor. <laughs> Uh, well, Luke, <laughs> after the first week of investing, uh, my portfolio to the second shows me at $1,080.47. That's very good. Do you think I'm ahead or behind? I think we know I'm behind. Mm -hmm. I'm, at least I'm still four digits. My portfolio is $1,080. And two dollars and eighty-eight cents. <laughs> so I'm up two bucks. <laughs> it's a week, right? A week it, is nothing. <laughs> a week is nothing. That's that's right. Let, lest we get uh, carried away. All right. So I think uh, uh, if this pace continues, I'll be uh, a filthy mil <laughs> multi-millionaire uh, by by the fifty-second episode. <laughs> Uh, getting served <laughs> dinner by our favorite humble badger. I like where this is going. I'll, uh, if you, if you can, hey, if you can do eight percent a week, then yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll be, I'll be moving in and just mirroring your <laughs> trades. Like, uh, like sneak peek ahead, he will not do eight percent a week. Trust me. <laughs> he might, he might do it. Eight percent up one week, it'll be eight percent down the next yeah, week. Yeah. Right. Okay, so we're on YouTube and all the major podcast platforms. Subscribe now for a financial podcast that's as fun and playful as it is insightful. You can also find us at wallstreetwildlife.com, all one word. A starting point for those who know there's an intelligent and principled way to become wealthy but haven't yet found a good jungle guide. You can also find me on twitter slash x where we'll be posting regular portfolio updates on our king of the jungle challenge um at seven the number seven flying platypus and i'm at seven luke hallard tweet us tell us if you're team badger or team monkey tell us about topics you want us to cover maybe you've got a different opinion on the uh, phoenix or dodo nanox tell me what you think about sticking 42 percent of your portfolio in one stock on day one Am I on my own here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, tell us what it feels like to be up 8% 8, 8 uh, in the first week. <clears throat> uh, are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. Rawr! <laughs> 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 <laughs>